that. So um, hopefully this talk is sufficiently philosophical to be the last one in the conference. Um, it's an exploratory look at uh, the structure of cooperation relative to uh, competition, ludic competition, and vice versa. Um, so hopefully it will be quite close to the paper if uh, just weighted a little differently. I'm talking slightly more about Bratman's account, Michael Bratman's account of this, which I'll be um, poking holes in, and a little bit less about everybody's favourite fraught concept um, in game studies. So it should look something like this. Um, I'm first going to look at Michael Bratman's uh, patented shared cooperative activity. Um, I'm going to sort of open it up a bit, make it a little bit less... Um, <laughs> So he tr attempts to make it very uh, airtight um, in the analytic tradition. Um, I'm going to try and extend the applicability of, of it with ideas from Herbert H. Clark and Margaret Gilbert, specifically um, their sort of notions of commitments and uh, social obligations. Um, we'll look at how that looks in hierarchical, hierarchical um, notation, and then I'm going to talk a bit about how that points to <coughs> the uh, epistemic um, indispensability or irresistibility of something magic circle-like um, but I remain agnostic as to which is the best. Well, no, I don't. Um, I won't be taking a strong position on which is the best uh, spatial or geometric uh, metaphor for whatever that does. So um, the topic falls under or, or is kind of contiguous to the uh, areas of collective intentionality or we intentions or acting, uh, doing things together. And um, the reason I picked Michael Bratman's account of shared cooperative activity as a starting point is because it seemed, when I looked at the literature, to be the most favoured or dominant or authoritative account, uh, account with many publications and um, he seemingly sort of spoke louder than the other people writing on the same uh, subjects and provided a very um, strong necessity and sufficiency based account of that uh, which in being um, descriptive of an ideal state of affairs rather than normative um, I think is a little bit prickly and not optimally um, instructive for us as people that are interested in uh, games which can often be uh, agonistic, that is, um, I'm using the term here, agonistic, to uh, connote something which is potentially prescriptively um, conflict-based. So uh, others have pointed out that Bratman's account of shared cooperative activity is uh, reducible in some ways to individuals' attentions, uh, individual intentions that could be people working around each other, doing uh, things together but not necessarily in a collaborative or um, really cooperative way and he sort of just doesn't attempt to capture uh, what a shared competitive activity can look like or the different ways in which um, an agonistic game can be approached and uh, played. So he and John Searle have both noted of course that um, many forms of rule bound conflict take place within uh, superordinate structures of cooperation um, whether they're uh, structured by rules or social norms and customs and um, indeed Bratman's account uh, he's conceded in some papers that it could use a, a revisiting and a modest modification but to the best of my knowledge has uh, declined to do so um, since it was first penned in 1992 uh, so I don't have time I don't think I forgot to start my watch but you'll keep me in check um, I don't have time to go into his account in precise detail uh, we wouldn't cover, I think, what's relevant to uh, the study of games. Um, but he begins the 1992 paper by outlining three main features of a shared cooperative activity. Um, the first being mutual responsiveness. In the case of uh, two-player um, Pokemon battle played over Game Boy Link cable, which is the example I'll keep going back to. Um, also, disclaimer, uh, some of the diagrams make reference to chess, and I, I feel slightly guilty that that's not necessarily a computer game, but let's just pretend it's computerized chess. So mutual responsiveness would simply be that I make a move, you make a move, I attack you, you attack me, as opposed to just walking off from our shared activity, um, which would be a serious lack of commitment to the joint activity. Um, the part where Bratman's account becomes problematic for agonistic games, and the reason he says that agonistic or competitive games can't qualify as a shared cooperative activity, is that uh, he doesn't discriminate between different motivations for different actions or intentions. So he states that a shared cooperative activity must have commitment to mutual support, which for him in chess or Pokemon would look like uh, two uh, competitors advising one another on how best to beat one another. So Mir Consalvo, though not writing with this paper in strictly in a philosophical tradition, um, states that we cannot understand gameplay by limiting ourselves to only seeing actions um, and I might add, seeing all actions uniformly, 
and not investigating reasons, context, justifications, limitations, and the like. And I very much agree with that, although I disagree with the um, somewhat polemical title of this 2009 paper, There Is No Magic Circle, uh, more on that later. And I also disagree with the comment that she makes in this paper that um, assuming the existence of anything like a magic circle uh, is presupposed by uh, structuralist notions vis-a-vis -vis game and gameplay ontology. Um, that's touched on more in the paper, but to press on. I think the first way of um, extending the applicability of Michael Brackman's account of shared cooperative activity, doing things together, is with Herbert H. Clark's, um, or two simple ideas from Herbert H. Clark's social action, social commitments. And he observes um, that commitments in any joint undertaking uh, emerge and accumulate, they stack up over time. This is obviously necessarily a temporal phenomenon. And that our common uh, sub goals or sub plans are often uh, renegotiated and reneged. Um, as contingencies appear in our activity, uh, maybe external factors, and demand a joint resolution by potentially by us uh, modifying our goals or making sacrifices in order to complete an activity. So um, to show exactly where uh, Bratman's account becomes problematic without describing his necessary and sufficient conditions in detail, um, here's his archetypal shared cooperative activity, painting the house together in hierarchical notation and the red arrow points to a little problem that I've made for it. So just to go over the structure very briefly, the um, primary goal, the primary shared goal is, is to paint the house together. We're going to do that together, um, meaning that it's not just us starting on opposite sides of the house and accidentally happening to do that together. Uh, so 1.1, we have to prepare the rooms. In order to do that, we have to do a bunch of other things that might emerge in the course of the activity. Um, under 1.2, we have to choose a colour. And I've inserted here, just to make trouble for him, 1.2.3.1. Um, we have to pick a colour. We, we simply can't agree on it. And we're going to decide by means of some uh, zero-sum um, competition or contest. It could be an arm wrestle, it could be a coin toss, it could be an entire uh, FIFA tournament. It really doesn't matter. The problem with Bratman's account is that he writes again and again and again that our sub-plans and sub-goals, um, if there's a competition or conflict, will only mesh down to a certain level. Um, and it's the way, it's his, it's his choice of kind of, it's the unidirectionality implicit in his language, uh, not just in the one paper, but in all of his writings on it, that I think presents serious problems, because it's as if we don't cash out the other uh, aspects of activity once we have finally achieved painting the house together. So for Bratman, if we can't decide on a colour and we have to flip a coin, one of us doesn't get what we want. Um, by the time we've finished painting the house, then the whole activity has not been a shared cooperative activity. Um, Herb H. Clark has two commitment types, which I think uh, one of them um, can modify the nature of a shared cooperative activity and make, make it uh, easier for us to understand games through this lens. Uh, so the first, which doesn't really warrant talking about in the parlance of um, shared activity, are simple other commitments. Simple other commitments are when one agent openly commits to another that they will perform an activity um, or a series of actions with minimal obligations beyond, um, in the concept of games, uh, the agonistic uh, ludic role. Um, an obvious example would be professional competitive esports for money, right? You might show up at a StarCraft uh, contest and then you don't really care if your opponent misses their train and uh, is forced to um, hand over the prize to you in default. You would still have uh, showed up and played your role and won and you would have got an easy victory. Maybe you don't get the glory, but um, that would be a simple other commitment to play StarCraft against someone, not exactly uh, with them. So needless to say, two people can't share a common uh, primary goal of beating one another. Uh, it's mutually exclusive. So. Um, oh, I forgot to put the next slide in. Uh, this is obviously not chess, this is um, tabletop uh, simulator. And let's just imagine that two or more people are playing uh, with simple, uh, simple other commitments against one another. Um, so playing an agonistic game competitively. And uh, they all uh, have the prim uh, individually held primary intention of just winning. Um, the only really ob obligations, the only real obligations that they have um, are not uh, cheating, really, or using exploits. And Michael Lieber, I think, in a 2008 paper um, at this very conference, uh, no, was it 2012? The reference is in here somewhere, um, stated that there, are, there is no magic circle in computer games uh, because the simulation upholds the rules for you. And that's um, 
perhaps true because this is a sandbox and then you can do what you want in it and then you have to, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm going off track. I just want an excuse to put this slide in. Um, this, is, this is a screen grab from a Steam review of Tabletop Simulator. People will kick you out of their servers in this game for using a VR headset and then sticking your head inside the Uno deck to see what the next card is going to be. Um, so that's one way in which you can fail to satisfy your obligations in a competitive round of Uno within Tabletop Simulator. But we're not talking about simple upper commitments. I think the more relevant uh, commitment type would be participatory commitments, which are more collaboratively binding. So according to uh, Clark, when two people make participatory commitments to one another, um, that is where uh, Bratman's idea of mutual support uh, really comes into play. You, you will be helping each other in achieving your joint um, primary goal. And I think with reference to play, uh, that really foregrounds the idea that it's possible to play non-seriously or non-competitively just for fun, just to pass the time. Um, you may not really care who wins and you will just be adopting the agonistic losery role uh, of the game of chess or whatever, assuming that it is competitive or agonistic. So I'm positing that it is possible to have a shared uh, common goal of just playing a nice game of chess together and then the contingencies which may emerge after that let's say uh, we didn't want to play chess we wanted to play something else I'll have an example in a minute and then it emerges over time that you must play an agonistic game uh, it would still be a shared co cooperative activity of passing the time together by playing a game so it's this point at which I blend into the mix Margaret Gilbert's um, prototypical social phenomenon of walking together and the only small detail I want to hone in on there is that um, like uh, Clark's participate sorry the other way around like Gilbert's walking together Clark's participatory commitments suggest the entitlement of one party to reprimand the other if any subversion of the joint action occurs so in walking together Gilbert talks about one person walking off much faster than the other that wouldn't be walking together it would be subverting the joint activity this commitment type implies common knowledge underlying a disposition to mutual obligations to fulfill the joint activity jointly um, so my silly example because there aren't enough pictures in this presentation let's say we go on a cabin trip together our intention is to have a two-person LAN party um, for some reason this this cabin has internet and electricity despite it being Theodore Roosevelt's cabin. Um, we're going to go questing. I don't like competition, so we, we, we're going to play some kind of MMO. Um, well, not MMO, just, just the two of us together. But we're going to do it cooperatively, because I hate competition. Unfortunately, there's a power cut, and um, we can't switch the PCs on. Fortunately, we both have our uh, Game Boys and the Game Boy Link Cable, because it's 1998. And uh, unfortunately, again, the only game available to us is Pokemon. I don't like competition, I say. I don't like agonistic... Uh, games, I don't like really being beaten. Don't worry, you say, I won't uh, hit you too hard and we'll have fun. We'll just pass the time together until the electricity comes back on and then we can go questing together cooperatively. Alright, then I say, I haven't played in a while and I've only got low level Pokemon. Uh, Bulbasaur, I choose you. Ha ha, you say, um, I've got a hideously overpowered Charizard up my sleeve. And under these circumstances, I would have every right to be salty uh, at you having broken your commitments and obligations and subverted our joint activity of not playing an agonistic game of Pokemon, but simply passing the time together. Um, so if only you would chill out and uh, use something like a, a, a low-level uh, basic type Pokemon, then I'm arguing that we could satisfy um, our mutually held primary goal of playing a nice game of X together. Just pretend it's not chess. Um, so the brackets on this diagram obviously denote the different, uh, for the meantime, let's say levels or layers of the activity, A being the entire activity, um, B being the necessarily uh, cooperative phase. If it were chess, we would have to set up the board as you've seen. If it's Pokemon, then we have to make sure that we distribute the batteries with remaining charge in them between us and plug in the link cable and so on. This is the necessarily uh, cooperative phase in order for us to even reach um, C, the gameplay phase. And when we commence play, of course, um, there's some loser attitudes that must be adopted. There's some kind of something like a magic circle instantiated. Um, and a term that I must admit that I naively hadn't heard before that was mentioned uh, either today or yesterday was um, the play modifier. Clearly there's something going on here. I don't think we can do away with something like a magic circle just yet, even if it is permeable. Um, so, uh, yes, it's 2008. Michael Lieber and Mia Consalvo have both um, suggested that there is no magic circle. And Lieber argues this quite well uh, with reference to computer games. Um, I'm, I'm not going to try and pick holes in that argument uh, beyond kind of 
uh, comments I made earlier. Um, but others have argued, Jesper Juhl and uh, Jakos Denros, I think both in papers for this very conference, have suggested that the idea that there is no magic circle or nothing that functions or serves the same purpose as it whatsoever is based on a misreading or too literal an interpretation of Huizenga, Kawa and uh, Salen and Zimmerman's um, somewhat unfortunately worded claims that it's really a circle and it really is magic and it really does exist. Um, I personally think that this, this hierarchical notation uh, is very easy to transpose or map onto um, something like concentric cognitive frames. Uh, this is adapted from Jesper Yule's um, diagram, three frames for every game action, which appears in the paper, the magic circle and the puzzle piece, or from the magic circle to the puzzle piece. Um, again, I'm agnostic on what kind of uh, shape uh, this, this, this thing takes. I'm not sure if I agree entirely with a puzzle piece, but for the meantime, concentric uh, circles um, referring to cognitive frames, where A, uh, the entire activity is the social context and to a degree your commitments, which are kind of established um, in a pre-losery phase. That's frame one, the outer circle. Um, the B bracket in the hierarchical notation uh, maps quite conveniently to frame two, the enabling <laughs> and shaping of gameplay. Um, and you switch between these uh, rapidly, obviously, you might be in-game, but then uh, pause only to remind your companion um, that their chess clock has, is run out or that the, the link cable is about to come loose and disconnect the game. Um, and then frame three, of course, is your uh, in, are your in-game attitudes, the loose free role, which is to some extent prescribed um, by the rules or the, the laws of the simulation, um, and the goal which um, you may or may not choose to identify entirely with. And in the paper, I've um, got a little section uh, where a, a, a mother plays, uh, a grandmaster um, chess player plays chess with her young daughter and is trying not to betray the fact uh, that she's not playing to the best of her ability. And you get a kind of, um, you, you can subdue certain uh, intentions or goals and you may or may not identify with the illusory objective of demolishing your opponent, especially if you're playing with a child or someone that you don't want to embarrass, either for the purposes of uh, social standing or uh, because you've simply agreed to do something cooperatively together. Um, so I think I might as well briefly mention the shortcoming of this account. Um, it fails to differentiate between what Michael Lieber calls the protective psychological bubble um, of the loser attitude uh, and the social contract which constitutes uh, the action of playing a game in a certain way. Um, but to return to Bratman then, and this is, the, this is his formulation which I didn't bother showing you earlier because as you can see it's quite lengthy and uh, dry. Um, one possible solution to it if you did want to uh, revisit that specifically is, well you can see that the font's different there, the writing on the right which spills over um, we intend to do all these things together according to our meshing subplans and sub goals unless it is common knowledge between us that we are to play a game, agonistic or otherwise, under participatory uh, commitments, that is, with a common primary goal and not with the individually held intention of attaining personal victory. And one thing that you have to sacrifice um, is that this only applies to cooperatively neutral uh, activities, which I don't have time to talk about, but you might have a clue as to what they are. Um, please feel free to ask questions about them. So in summary, um, I think contextual factors are just as relevant as intentions and actions um, in cooperative uh, or competitive gameplay analysis, even if that kind of expands it from um, the strict remit of analytic philosophy. Uh, commitment types, uh, simple other commitments and participatory commitments illustrate this and they can help us separate earnest in-game conflict from only uh, superficial um, conflicts which might emerge as a, as a consequence of having to play a certain game in a certain way. And hierarchies, um, I suggest, uh, are a nice way of visualizing this and translate well to uh, something like a magic circle as concentric cognitive frames. And the last thing I'll say is, um, of course, that uh, Irving, there are many Gothmanian-inspired um, accounts of keying and framing, I think, which are slightly different from the type of frames that I'm talking about here. But A, it's far more sociological uh, than even this, and B, I uh, have run out of time. Thank you. Thank you very much also for sta staying exactly on time. Now we have some time for questions. Yes. Um, this is just a 
question, I guess. Yes, um, I, I enjoyed the discussion of, of Bratman a lot. Um, I'm more familiar with that literature than I am with the literature about whether or not there is a magic circle, or I haven't really gotten much further than using it. Mm. So could you, just, could you just make as explicit as possible um, what it is that, in your argument that there, that there is a magic circle or something like it, what's the, what is it that's crucial or essential about adhering to specifically competitive gameplay um, that restores what you take to be fundamental to the magic circle? Sorry, could you repeat the last part again? So, so can you tell me what it is that, why you think that there needs to be some essential appeal to competitive gameplay rather than other kinds of gameplay? And establishing this case for the magic circle. That was just the inference that, that right, I didn't right. quite get by the end. I think that um, it's kind of a reciprocal thing. I think the magic circle can help extend the applicability of shared cooperative action. Uh, so if I go back to the... Um, Bratman says that uh, the activity, in order to even consider this analysis, the activity should be cooperatively neutral, which is what I've um, crossed out. And the idea there is that there are certain things that you uh, can do alone, and when you choose to do that with another person, that's a cooperative action of course, um, cooperative activity. Cooperatively loaded activities are things like chess and two-player Pokemon. They need two people. Um, and there's a weird tension in his writing, I'm sure you've noticed it, where he talks about the fact that um, this account should be able to extend to cover that. It would be a desirable thing uh, to talk about how um, rule-bound competitions function as cooperative activities. Um, but he hasn't declined to do it. I think, I think I've gone off track uh, with regard to your question. But I think the, the magic circle or something which serves the same purpose of it is a, is a way of distinguishing um, serious actions from non-serious ones, which, which sort of improves his account vastly and could be figured into it. So, so you said the contingency of him not, not having a, a special proviso for, com for competitive games Yes, so he's, yeah. he's touched on it and said that it re requires further clarification, but um, is agnostic as to how. Oh. And I think this, this is one way of doing it, just small modifications to this original <coughs> formulation. Okay. Any other questions? Maybe brain on it while I will dare ask you a question. So I know you said initially that you didn't want to go into too much detail with the magic circle or the magic mm. circle theory, but in the end it kind of seems as if your argument depends on it. And I'm wondering how you, you know, when you present Jesper Yule's argument or Jakub Steinros that, you know, the critique of the magic circle is kind of invalid because it depended on, on a wrong reading of the concept of Hösinga, mm. who only ever mentions it, I think, four or five times in his book. Um, or on, um, I, I would say maybe uh, a wrong reading by Salon Zimmerman of Rosenkra. But mm. what what do you what do you mean by magic circle or something like it? Yeah. Is it like the Steinros and and Montola spatial social uh, temporal frames and, and limitations or? Yeah. Um, so on, uh, the the first part of your question, I'm not. Mm. This this argument does depend on a magic circle, but I think it also the way it figured into the paper originally was that it the hierarchic analysis more pointed to the necessity of it as um, in salvaging uh, Bratman's account, as it were. Um, I understand it as something which emerges as as a social contract and as um, Stenros says, as a, no Lever says, as a, as a protective psychological bubble. So obviously, it is not something which is. Uh, absolute and exists, um, I, I might be minting my terms here, but it exists metaphysically, it, whatever it is, it is permeable in the sense that it's, it takes the form of an understanding between people, and it's not something, and I think this is where the misreading lies, it's not something which makes um, play activities impervious to uh, micro or macro level uh, forces like politics and economics, and even um, two scholars at uh, Digra earlier this year pointed out that um, some people think that the the meta game of online abuse um, counts as a type of play, and obviously the people on the receiving end of that abuse aren't um, impervious from uh, hurt because there's a magic circle. So there isn't a magic circle in that sense, but there is in the sense that uh, when we adopt the loser attitude, we we modify our kind of expectations as to what conflict constitutes and how consequential it is. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, a very, very, I think, simple question, and it's totally fair if your answer is no, I haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, 
I was just wondering, you, you described a certain way of playing this amicable chess game with that. Yeah. Um, and I was, that just made me think, um, would you say, for example, in case of, for example, also uh, single player games, that our, our approach to games as researchers can be reconciled with that or explained with that? Because I, I don't know about you or everybody's play practices, but sometimes I just stop myself while playing a game as a scholar and become painfully aware that I'm just now scholaring this game, not playing it. Right, right. So my, kind of my question, that's the, no, I haven't thought about it part, that's sort of, have you, have you considered how far you can push this? Because, oh, so, or, turn it around, is that, that two-player arrangement that you talk of, yeah. is that kind of a special case of something bigger you assume there, you feel might be there, or is that all you're going for? As, and, and I mean, it's big and, and not, Modest. Okay, you appear to be a number two, aren't you? Um, <laughs> right. Always. Oh, um, I'll try and keep it brief then. I don't think this account uh, extends to single player play because um, it's kind of contingent on uh, common knowledge between two people. But what you've said does certainly speak to um, a weakness of this account, which is that it doesn't help you visualize or understand uh, the ways in which people's attitudes towards a gameplay experience can morph and transmute over time. So it's this kind of functions on the assumption that two people make a commitment to play a game in a certain way and then don't have ulter ulterior motives or get more competitive and serious about it as the time uh, progresses. Whereas when you're playing on your own, obviously you can either what you described or you can have an opposite thing where you start off playing casually and then as the game starts to get to you, you're like, I'm going to beat this thing. Um, and then you're playing very seriously and you might rage quit. Um, so I, I don't think this account is in any way really useful for single player play. Yeah. Thanks. So as we can maybe hear from the bells ringing, I think unfortunately we're out of time. But fortunately there is both a coffee break now at the other venue and then also an after party tonight where we can continue the discussion. But thank you for your presentation once again, Julie.